if you will, a little different style of service today. So if you will, stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. I have no set scripture. You, you see that up there. So just, uh, if you will, stand with me. Uh, in Job chapter 12, verse 10, the man Job asked this question. In whose hand is the life of every living being and the breath of all mankind? Solomon answers that question in Proverbs 16, verses 4 and 5. It says this, The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone who is, who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not go unpunished. Let's pray. Great God, thank you for your mercy and grace. Uh, thank you for letting us be here today. Lord, today, uh, this day is just kind of different in a way. It's still the Lord's day and we still worship you, but Lord, some things we want to look at today that are just disturbing and we see it happening in our nation and around this world. And that's the, that's the evil of abortion. And Lord, we, as we look today at the sanctity of life, as we try to come to terms with some things, uh, where does all this hate come from? And Lord, we know that you didn't create hate. All good things come from you. All good things come from you. So Lord, we know that it, it comes from the evil one. But Lord, as we preach today, God, I pray that you speak to every heart and help us to focus on the, the ills of this world and, and the things that are going on. God, that we lift up our voices and, and pray and cry out to you. God, change the hearts of men. Because that's where the change is going to come, Lord, when your Holy Spirit enters the heart of man and, and saves him from his, his depravity. So, Lord, we look to you to answer those prayers because only through you, only through your Holy Spirit, can a person be saved. And so, Lord, I pray that you speak to every heart. I pray that you speak to everyone who will see this video. And, Lord, that everything we say and do here today we may bring you glory and honor in all things. And we ask this in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen. You can be seated. I want to repeat that, verse, that last verse again. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. A Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. Now, this verse does, it, it calls no one. Every, everybody at some point, we've all had proud moments. That's why we're sinners, because of the pride of man. And so, every individual, group, and nation who are proud of heart, he, he's got them all wrapped up in that one verse. The United States is certainly not short on pride. That's for certain. There are plenty of sins that we could tee off on, but our focus today is on this one particular sin. It is a blight against this nation. It's a blight on this nation. Fifty years ago to the date, to the date, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Roe v. Wade legalizing the murder of the unborn. And there's no nice way to put that. You, they can call it abortion. They can call it a fetus. They can say all these things. That is an unborn child. Unborn. And it's nothing but murder. And so the one sin, that one sin alone is enough to bring the wrath of God down on this nation. Think about this. The wholesale murder of unborn babies is nothing more than the legalization of child sacrifice. And we as a nation have the gall to sing God bless America. How can we do that? How can we do that? Four years ago to this date, Former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo signed it, the Reproductive Health Act into law. Now, the title Reproductive Health sounds good and noble, but it's anything but that. Uh, here's what the Reproductive Health Act did. One, it legalized abortion up to 24 weeks of gestation, and anything beyond the 24 weeks would be deemed legal if the woman's health or life were at risk or the unborn child was not viable. That means the woman could carry her baby all the way up to term, and in the moment before birth, she could say, her life, or have a doctor say, her life's at risk, and they would kill the child. Isn't that something? Secondly, it permitted the advanced practice clinicians, which are physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, and licensed midwives to lawfully provide abortion services if they've had the appropriate qualifications and if it falls within the scope of their practice. Surgical abortion is an invasive procedure, but they stand in approval of a midwife performing this act. And thirdly, it removed abortion from the criminal code. Removing abortion from the criminal code means that if a pregnant woman is assaulted and if the unborn baby dies as a result of that assault, there would be no prosecution 
for the one uh, for the death of the baby. Now, here's an example. Let me tell you what happened. February of 2019, a month after this thing was signed, the Queens District Attorney's Office dropped a charge of second-degree murder against a man who murdered his pregnant girlfriend, saying that their ability to press the charge was repealed because of the Reproductive Health Act. Now, he was still charged with murder. He was charged with the murder of his girlfriend, but they dropped that charge because it's, it, uh, the death of the child said it did, and it didn't have any effect on the sentencing. But the thing is, this unborn child, because of that act, that unborn child's life did not count. Did not count. And this is what the lawmakers and the bystanders there in the gallery of the state senate in New York, whenever he signed that, they stood up and they cheered. A standing ovation. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. Now let's fast forward three and a half years to June. Uh, June uh, 24th, 2022. After 49 and a half years of federally protecting the murder of the unborn, the United States Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. Now, this was an answer to every pro-lifer's prayer, and it was a nightmare to all the pro-choicers. But what does that mean exactly? What exactly does all that mean? Well, it means abortion is no longer federally protected right in the United States. The decision to allow or curtail or ban abortion altogether is now up to each individual state. Of course, the liberal left sees this as a total defeat, making the claim that half the states will soon make abortion illegal. And my prayer is that it becomes illegal in all 50 states plus Washington, D.C. But if I read the chart right, at present, there are 14 states where abortion is illegal. Only 14. We got 50 states, plus Washington, D.C. Only 14 where it's illegal. Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, Idaho, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, West Virginia, and Wisconsin is all illegal. Iowa has some limited exceptions. Georgia has a six-week ban in effect, meaning that you, on, on most abortions it makes it inaccessible, meaning the first six weeks is all they have. If they want to have an abortion, they've got to get it done in that first six weeks of pregnancy. In South Carolina, abortion was declared illegal the moment a heartbeat was detected, but last week, just last week, their court, their Supreme Court, found it unconstitutional and deemed abortion legal up to five months. So they flipped on it. What about abortion in North Carolina? Well, according to the New York Times, a woman can get an abortion up to 20 weeks in the state of North Carolina. Washington Post reported this, that the Republicans failed to win a veto-proof majority in the state legislature during the midterms, which means our liberal Democratic governor has the power to block abortion restrictions. And he has. And this doesn't surprise anybody because July 6th, just, just several weeks after uh, the, the, the overturn of Roe v. Wade, Mr. Cooper signed an executive order that shielded out-of-state abortion patients from extradition and prohibited state agencies under his control from assisting other state prosecutions of those who travel to, to North Carolina to have this procedure. Now, he wanted to make quote unquote, North Carolina, a sanctuary state for women who want an abortion. And he said he would use all his authority over this restriction or extradition warrants to protect the providers of the, and these patients from the state so that they could so that they couldn't punish these residents who were crossing state lines who want to have an abortion. A sanctuary. Do you know what the definition of sanctuary is? A safe place. Really? It's not a safe place. It's not safe for the unborn. It's a sanctuary, all right? It's a sanctuary for all that revenue that's going to come in from other states because they got to pay for these procedures. These things ain't free. And if, if Medicaid or Medicare is paying for some of them, guess what? That's your money because that's coming from the government. And so that's the sanctuary for the money. It's what it's always been about, folks. It's always been about money. That's what this, this whole thing is about, lining people's pockets. Now, here's one more thing before, and we'll move on. And this is from the Hope Pregnancy Center newsletter. Abortion pills for medically induced abortions made up 54% of reported abortions in 2020. 
Just recently, the FDA made this approval. They approved, they declared, and I probably ain't going to say this word right, mefrespastone, which is the first pill in an abortion, uh, abortion pill regimen to take. It made it safe enough where it can be dispensed by all the local pharmacies, as long as they had the right certifications. Now, and if that's not bad enough, the United States Postal Service says they can legally deliver these pills to every state in the Union, regardless of that state's law on how, they're to, how this stuff is supposed to be administered. So in medical abortions, I mean, that means anybody can get them through the mail. That's bad. That's a bad thing. Medical abortions have more risk factors, which make it, and, and so making them more available creates a more serious problem. So without a doubt, when the Superior Court, what they did last year was great for everyone who's a pro-life person. But now listen, don't be lulled into thinking that we're okay. The fight's not over. The fight's still going. There are 33 states and Washington, D.C., or maybe th was it 33 or 36 states, I forget now which, that in Washington, D.C., they're still allowing abortion to come, to happen. And they got them, they got them on that graph. They got them how, what they allow, and there's a bunch of them, no holes barred. No holes barred. So here's the straight truth. Until the Lord comes, until the Lord returns and makes everything right, mankind is going to continue to kill himself, which is exactly what Satan wants. He's never going to stop trying to annihilate the human race. From 1973 until now, just through, just through the method of abortion alone, Satan has successfully deceived mankind into legally killing approximately 65 million babies, and that's just in this country. Wow. 50 years of murdering babies. Let that number sink in. 65 million children that were fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, murdered, sacrificed by their parents because it inconvenienced that time in their life. You probably killed somebody that was the next daughter that could cure cancer. You probably killed the next greatest president we'd ever have in this country. You probably killed somebody that, uh, somebody that would contribute to society in a great and mighty way. But you know what? We'll never find out because you took their life. Satan is the driving force in all this. Every bit of it. All to destroy the human race. And abortion is not the only thing that he's using. Along with abortion, Satan has, he uses hatred. He uses war, disease, starvation, alcoholism, drug abuse to try and decrease, ultimately to destroy humanity. He's using homosexuality to hinder the increase of the population because where science and biology are concerned, Adam and Steve and Madam and Eve can never procreate. It'll never happen. I don't care what you do. I don't care how you want to look at it with your liberal idea. It's not going to take place. Period. And, and y'all going to think I've bumped my head here when I tell you this, but that's okay. I think there's a possibility that the children who received a COVID vaccine could end up sterile. And you say, Donnie, you're crazy. Well, I have four words for you. Long-term effects. Long-term side effects. That's four words. Not, I left one out. Long-term side effects. It's going to be a while before this can be determined. But 5, 10, 15 years down the road, when there happens to be a noticeable dent in the population growth, all these egghead statisticians are going to get together and they're going to find that common denominator and they're going to come right back to 2021 and 2022 when they forced everybody or tried to force everybody to get that shot. Little bitty kids now. And don't be surprised when it happens. You say the government wouldn't do anything like that. Oh, you know, yes, they would. They already have. They already have. It is estimated during the 12 years of the Nazi regime, 400,000 people were forced, had forced sterilization on them. Forced. Now, here's something I didn't know. Forced sterilization remains legal today in the, at a federal level in the United States because of a 1927 Supreme Court case known as Buck versus Bell. A lady named Carrie Buck, she was feeble-minded, and she was committed to a state mental institute. Her condition had been present in her family, according to the article, for three generations. And so Virginia law allowed for the sexual sterilization of inmates and of institutions to promote, quote, health of the patient and welfare of society, end quote. So what has all this got to do with the sanctity of human life? This right here. God is the creator of all life, and Satan doesn't like it. 
He doesn't like it. He hates God. He hates everything that God created. And he especially hates the human race. Period. Why? For starters, we're created in God's image. Among, uh, among all of God's creation, man is the most unique because we have been created in his image, in his likeness, which means in simplest terms, we were made to resemble the Father. And so when Satan sees us, he is constantly reminded that we are God's crown jewel of creation. And he's not. And he's not. And this is why he entices, instigates, and deceives the hearts and minds of depraved men so that they will continue to destroy themselves. Jesus declared this in, in John 8, 44, that Satan was a, mur was a murderer from the beginning. So when was the beginning? Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 says this, Then the Lord God took man, took the man, and put him in the, into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. So when God created all living things whose life is in its blood, in particular Adam and Eve, He issued this warning that they would die if they disobeyed His command. One command. One command. Don't eat that from that tree. And the moment they sinned, death began. began. It made Satan mad. Listen, it made Satan mad when God created Adam and Eve and Adam and put him over dominion, over his, put him in dominion over his creation and not him. And not him. How do we know that? Because Satan has always wanted to be Lord over something. Isaiah 14, 13 through 14 says this. He gives us his initial plan. The Lord said of Satan, here's the Lord speaking for what Satan was revealed in his heart. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven and I will raise my throne above the stars of God and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. He wanted to be equal with God and he wanted to lord over all of God's creation, but God wouldn't let him and never and he never will. But as for man, Psalm 8 verse 5 says, Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crowned him with glory and majesty. So what Satan coveted the most was to be crowned with the glory and majesty that God gave to man. And God gave it to man instead, not Satan. And after that happens, well, Satan went after man. Either appearing as a serpent or possessing the body of a serpent, Satan deceived Eve by planting a seed of doubt in her mind concerning God's ways. And as they say, the old saying goes, the rest is history. In Genesis 3, 13, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So by what Jesus said in John 8, 44, regarding Satan's participation in man's fall of the garden, well, God found guilt, uh, Satan guilty of murder. His murder weapon was deceit, and he used it to encourage Eve to commit sin. John W. Rittenbaugh wrote this. He said, she didn't completely overlook her respect for God, but discounted it enough to give in to Satan's persuasion. She did this on the strength of her desire, fueled by her lust for the pleasure of eating the forbidden fruit, but even more so to fulfill her desire to become wise. Then Adam, though not deceived as Eve, was also discounted, uh, also discounted God's counsel in order to make sure he did not displease Eve. He was guilty of idolatry, end quote. Satan used deceit as a means to murder Adam and Eve. And he's, been, he's still using it to this day. The Lord said in his Olivet Discourse and in Revelation that we would witness a rise in the intensity of deceit just prior to his return. And everything that I just mentioned to you just a few minutes ago, the things that Satan is using to destroy humanity has certainly intensified. It has intensified. And man's depravity continues to wax worse and worse. But God had a predetermined plan in place long before creation began. As, and here it is, John 1.14 says, The Word, God, became flesh in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the, of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. During the Lord's earthly ministry, He revealed two truths about Satan that He didn't want revealed. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus reveals this first truth. He said, The thief, talking about Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. You've heard the old saying, We were poor, we were poor, but we didn't know it. 
well. Mankind was hopelessly lost and at the mercy of Satan, and he didn't know it because why? He was living in darkness. Living in darkness. And then the light of the world came and revealed the truth about this scoundrel that he was a thief and a murderer. He steals man's joy, he kills man's hope, and in the end he destroys men's souls. The second truth Satan didn't want revealed says Jesus, I came that they, lost and hopeless mankind, may have life and have it abundantly. What is this abundant life that Jesus is referring to? Well, he's certainly not talking about this life because this life is still under the curse of death and sin. The abundant life that the Lord is talking about, of course, is the eternal life that can only come, can only be found in Him and lived where? In heaven, in His presence. But to be more specific, here's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. He says, I pray that my eyes, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of the inheritance in the saints. What, is Paul, what, what Paul is saying here is this that we would come to know the immeasurable privilege of being fully acquainted with the abundant, inexhaustible benefits of the Christian hope that comes from knowing Jesus. Jesus Christ as Lord. For us to enjoy this infinity of wealth, He has made it available for everyone who has placed their trust in Him. Until you place your trust in Christ, fully in Christ, surrender to His Lordship, you cannot know the benefits of this. Again, verse 19, he says, And what is the surprising greatness of this power toward us who believe? This power that he's talking about is exercised toward the believer is not a simple one act, a single act, but it is the power of Christ at work in us continuously. There's power that is exerted in our conversion. There is power that keeps us saved. There is power that raises us from the dead. And there is power that's going to exalt us to Christ in heaven. Verse 19, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might. Verse 20, which He, God, brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand, at His right hand in the heavenly places. Are y'all picking up on what's happening right here? Let me read this again. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly places. The right hand is the place of prominence and power. Verse 21, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, Jesus Christ was exalted to the highest conceivable dignity and honor. He is Lord of all, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. The age, the one that co is coming, is the ultimate reign of the Lord Jesus Christ and the end of Satan's rule. Verse 22, and he put all things, all things means all things, but in particular, I want to stress Satan, sin, and his minions. They are all defeated and in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Church, listen to me. Satan is angry with God because Jesus Christ, the God man, the second Adam, who came and took on human flesh, he lived a sinless life. Satan tempted him with everything that he could muster, but he could not persuade him to do what the second Adam did. He couldn't persuade him to submit to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life like the first Adam did. He couldn't do it. The second Adam is the Word of God who became flesh and dwelt among men. And he died on the cross for the sins of all who would put their trust in him. And right until this moment, right now at this very moment, he is sitting at the, down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become much better than the angels. And remember, Satan is what? Lucifer is what? He was the anointed cherub. So it says in Ezekiel 28, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Hebrews 1, 3, and 4. Jesus, the God man, the second Adam, has, and has for this, and, and as a matter of fact, has always had this name. Satan has always wanted this name. He always wanted that more excellent name. And what name is that? Lord. He wanted to be called Lord. Jesus is the Lord of all creation. Amen? Amen. Now watch this. The hits just keep on coming. Watch what he does. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, it says this. But God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. How great is God's love toward us? His love has heights and depths and lengths and breadths that are immeasurable. Verse 5 says, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. God gave us new life, and He gives new life to everyone who puts their trust in Him. 
And the only way a dead person can have any fellowship with the living God is for God to give him, her or her, a new life. Regeneration is an act of God's grace. Regeneration results in the commencement and the continuation of new life. The phrase, have been saved, is in the, in the perfect tense in Greek, indicates an ongoing permanent condition. In other words, once he's got you, he's got you. And you don't want him to let go. And that's one thing for sure. You don't have to fear that he's going to let go. I don't care what anybody says. He's not going to let you go. And he's not going to let you walk away. You might try to stray, but I tell you what, he'll take you to the woodshed. If you're his child, he'll take you to the woodshed. And besides giving us new life, listen to this. Listen to what else God does. Verse 6, he says, He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read that again. He raised us up in Him, or with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? Spiritually speaking, God has raised us up. All who have put their trust in Christ has raised us up with Christ in glory. Physically, He will one day raise us up, but spiritually He has already raised us up to a new type of life in Christ. Paul said this in Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Therefore you have been raised up with Christ. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is. See at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Like our Lord's resurrection life, so is ours, powerful and eternal. What Satan was harboring in his heart, the Lord reveals it in Isaiah 14, 14. Satan said, I will make myself like the Most High. Satan wanted to exalt his throne next to the Most High and to be equal to him. No one can be equal to God. Satan's pride got him kicked out of heaven, but God has seated us. Listen, He has seated us, creatures made from dirt, in the heavenly realms with Christ, Ephesians 1.20. I just read that. What Christ did physically, what He did dying on the cross by raising from the dead and took His seat in the heavenly places, God has already done for us spiritually. Romans chapter 6 verse 4, Therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, listen, so we too might walk in newness of life. Amen, preacher. That's good stuff, ain't it? That's good stuff. And the fact that God enabled Christ to do these things physically should help us to believe that what He has done there, He can do, he can do that spiritually as well. Because one glorious day we're going to see the full culmination of the Lord's promise. The Lord Jesus said in Revelation 3.21, He who ever comes I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. God is going to allow us, now somehow, and I don't know how this works, so don't even ask me to explain it, but somehow he's going to let us sit on the throne with him. Satan's prideful plan was to reign with God, but it was never his right to assume such a thing. It was never his right to make that assumption. Instead, by the grace of God, we have been given that right through Jesus Christ. God made us, not Satan, to have dominion, to rule, to lord over creation, and to rule and reign with Him in His glory. Not Satan. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 12. There's the first part of 12. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, what did it say? We will also reign with Him. R.C. Sproul said, We forfeited our ability to fulfill this vocation in Adam, but Christ has succeeded in reigning over creation as the last Adam. In Him we are now able once more to achieve our original purpose as righteous rulers of the world, end quote. And while we reign with the Lord, one of our duties will be, will involve judging even the angels. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 6 verse 3, the Greek word for judge can mean rule or to govern. Now since the Lord Himself is going to judge the fallen angels, it probably means that we're going to have some sort of a rule in eternity over holy angels. But holy angels are ministering spirits. They minister to us. And so it's, it makes sense for that to be that way. Until then, we're to reign over what? Our sin sinful passions, our bringing our minds into subjection, our wills and our affections into submission to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit through His Word. This is why Satan hates us. This is why Satan is doing everything he can to destroy the human race through abortion and all those other things I named off. That's why he's doing it. Now I'm not 100% sure, but I think G. Campbell Morgan is the one who made this statement. 
He said, The destiny of redeemed men and women to one day be higher than the angels and to sit in even, and even sit in judgment of them must greatly annoy a certain high angel in heaven. He did not want to serve an inferior creature now, and he did not want that inferior creature to be raised up higher than even he. So he rebelled against God, and is determined to keep as much humanity, as much of, huma of humanity as possible from sitting in judgment of himself. We can imagine the perverse, proud pleasure Satan takes over every soul that goes to hell. Quote, they won't sit in judgment of me. You know, we, we've been made victorious. But our current physical state, we must, listen, we must continue to walk in caution for Satan is still a powerful adversary. And listen, I don't care what anybody says, we're no match. We're no match for his deceitful devices of wrath. I mean, we're not. However, we can rejoice because Jesus Christ, through him, we have and can trust in all his promises, all the promises of God to receive power over sin and to refrain from all temptation. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 says plainly, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Listen, don't stand there with your chest stuck out like you've done something because you ain't done anything. Once you make him flee, then you retreat back to the Father and you hang close to the Master because the enemy might run from you for a little bit, but they're just going back to regroup and come back. He's coming back. I promise you, he's coming back. Each of us, from the youngest to the oldest, we were created and fashioned in God's image. We're blessed with immeasurable worth. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. At the time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them. And said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted, and that word writer converted, the Greek word here for converted is strepho, which means to change one's mind. Unless your mind is changed, unless your heart is changed, unless you, and the only way to do that is to submit to the Lord's, to Christ's lordship, and become like children. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as his child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it will be better for him to have, have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to those who purposely seek to hinder and hurt God's children. And I include babies in that. If they don't repent, if these people don't repent, they will feel the full wrath of God's judgment. And that goes for an individual, that goes for the group, that goes for an organization, and that goes for any government on any level. The Lord said in Genesis 9, 6, Whoever sheds man's blood, by, man's, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made men. And guess what? God has not changed his mind on that subject. He, is, he has not changed his mind on that subject. As for Satan... His die is cast, man. There's no repentance available for him. There's never, there never has been. For him awaits the worst possible torment. Revelation 20.10 says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into a, the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. We cannot fathom the magnitude of that torment. Don't want to either. I don't want to know anything about that. But we, that is every believer and every baby that's been sacrificed, shall always be with the Lord. You say even babies that have never had a chance to surrender to the Lordship of Christ? Absolutely. Here's what a psalmist said. Psalm 22, 9 and 10. This is, this is a freebie. I didn't give this to Paul. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I cast, I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Babies were they when they were defenseless and could not withstand the evil intentions of man, the evil intentions of mankind have always been safe in the arms of God. They've been safe in the arms of God. Me, you, and everybody, when we were born, we were safe in the arms of God. God allowed us to grow. God allowed us a chance to, to grow and to, and to surrender to His Lordship. But for those babies that can't, they're safe in the arms of God. And I, and I rejoice in that. God's great. And God's greater than our adversary. 
And this thing that's going on, yeah, there, there, it's wonderful that Roe v. Wade was overturned. I am so thankful for that. But we got a whole bunch of other states that need to do the same thing. I mean completely. Because this murder will still go on. Because why? Because Satan hates mankind. The sanctity of human life is precious. Life is precious. God created life. He breathed life. When it comes from the Father, guess what? It's special. It's special. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God, thank you for your mercy and grace and for letting us be here today. Lord, we thank you for what, uh, what you've given us to preach on. And Lord, help us to understand and realize the enemy is always present. Lord, there's coming a day when he's not going to be, and that's when all things are going to be made right. But until then, Lord, in your time, in your time, God, use us that are, that are here, that you have saved, that you have called to yourself to be witnesses to those who don't know you. Lord, I pray that you would protect agencies like Hope Pregnancy Center. Lord, as they try to minister to these young women who are going through a crisis because of a, a decision they made and, and the consequences are more than they, they never considered. God, I pray that you would bless them and give them the words to say and to help this person, help that young lady make the right decision. And Lord, even lead some to Christ. Lord, I pray your blessings upon, that, upon every one of them at work there. But God, help us to continue doing the same things as we're out about, to witness the love of Christ to other people. Lord, we love you and we thank you for what you're doing in our lives today. May you be glorified in what we do. And we ask this in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen.